We're still yelling at people and we still have careless words and we still don't passionately love Jesus. We still don't give our life to the cause of the kingdom. We still don't do anything that matters spiritually. We're leveraging God to be hashtag blessed. And that's not the body of Christ being the body of Christ. That's the body of Christ leveraging God to their own ends. And that has no place. We don't follow God because he gives us what we want. We follow God because he's worthy. We are going to try to tackle Revelation 15 and 16 today. Now, the good news is, um, are you okay? Yes. Okay. We had a we had teacup down. Um, <laughs> what was I talking about? Revelation 15 and 16. Uh, we're going to read the entire chapter of 15 and then we're just going to kind of talk about chapter 16. But the good news is it's only eight verses. And so uh, what I want to talk about today is the trouble with trouble. The, the trouble with trouble is we keep trying to find a way out of it. And trouble is often something that the Lord uses for us to go through, not to avoid. And that doesn't mean that we need to beg God for trials. What it means is we need to not be afraid when trials come, when trials come. And they do. They do come. So we're going to begin uh, with Revelation 15, and uh, we'll see if we can't tie some things down here. Okay. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues. Yay. Yay which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. Okay, so in order for God to complete the work of his wrath in the world, which by the way, there are volumes written on the subject of God's wrath. We're not, I, there's no way for us to adequately treat that subject here. Um, but what I want to say is, in order for God's wrath to be completed, these plagues have to come. They have to come. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses. Okay, when you think song of Moses, where does your mind immediately go to? Hmm? Red Sea. Yeah. Crossing of the Red Sea. They cross the Red Sea. The waters collapse on the Egyptian army and they sing praises. Moses leads them in the song. The horse and the rider have fallen into the sea. Okay? So already what we have here is this Exodus imagery. Let's see if we can keep picking up on it. The servant of God and the song of the Lamb saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, and all the nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts will have been revealed. By the way, awesome... When are God's righteous acts revealed in this context of this chapter? As we go through the plagues, God's righteous acts are revealed, and because of how we go through the plagues, all the nations come to worship him. Which means that when we avoid suffering... We're losing a major piece of the weight of our testimony. We have to be willing to endure it, not escape it. By the way, 
and again, I've been picking on this a little bit here and there, but I just want to offer that according to this, it doesn't look like anybody's going to be escaping these plagues. It looks like people are going to have to go through it. And we have to go through it because that's how we tell the world how strong our God is. After this, I looked in the sanctuary of the tent of witness. Okay, what's the tent of witness? Ooh. It's the tabernacle. Where do we see the tabernacle? Huh? In the Exodus. So we have more Exodus imagery here. Why? Why are we, why there's so much Exodus imagery? Why? Well, we probably should talk about that. The, t- the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen. By the way, that's the priestly garments, with golden sashes around their chests, and one of the four living creatures gave the, to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God. So they're carrying the plagues, and they also get a bowl of God's wrath. Why don't you eat a big bowl of God's wrath? Um, who lives forever and ever, and the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So now, this is the end of chapter 15, and and what we're going to do in chapter 16 is we're going to unveil the seven plagues from the seven angels. Okay? So the bowls of wrath, the first one is sores. Okay, is there anywhere else where sores becomes a problem for people rooted in God's wrath? Is this a a plague? The answer to that is yes. Then the second one is we have blood in the sea, and then number three is blood in the springs and rivers. Is there any other place where God turns water into blood? Now we're starting to see why are we pulling on these images? By the way, if you know, if you, if you know your scriptures and you think about this from a, from a Hebrew perspective, the plagues in, in Exodus aren't random. They're a direct attack on the chief gods of the Egyptian pantheon. Each one of them is. Which means that what these plagues are is God unfolding how to go head to head with the gods of our world. You gotta be like, that's cool. Because God is one by one by one beating out what the, the things that we chase. Then, number four, is the sun scorches people with fire. Now, is that a plague in Egypt? No, but it's tied to another Israelite deliverance story. So, that. Then, we have the number, then then we have darkness. Is darkness one of the plagues in Egypt? Yes. Yes, it is. Then we have the Euphrates dries up and there's a whole bunch of frogs. Now, by the way, for the Euphrates to dry up is kind of a big deal. But then we have frogs. Are frogs attached to the plagues in Egypt? Yes. By the way, this sixth bowl, this is where Armageddon is. And you're like, oh, that's a big, let's talk about Armageddon. All right, we will. Hang with me. Then we have thunder and rain and earthquakes as the final plague. And, and, and what's interesting with that is the, any time that there's like a series of hurricanes or earthquakes, or everybody's like, is this revelation? <laughs> uh, 
These are the places where God delivers us through, not from. God delivers us through the plagues, not from them. And that's important. So we, as followers of Jesus, put God on display by how we endure the plagues, not by the fact that we escaped them. That's just the way it is. Now, we talked about, uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about fleeing, right? Like, do we stand and fight or do we run and hide? And both of these things are part of like God's call, but either way, both sides have to endure the plagues. The plagues, you can't run and escape a plague. You can run and hide, but the plague will find you. So it's not about how we escape these things. It's about how we endure them. Here's, here's the, the reason why that matters. So many of us are, we live our Christian life as if we're like, I just, I just want to be part of the winning team. Right? I want to be part of the winning team. And so I want to attach myself to a winner. So we go to whatever church we think has it going on or whatever, and we, I just want to be a part of a winner. I don't want to be a part of a winning organization. <clears throat> I don't think that's what God is calling his church to. To win. I want to be a part of the making much of the God who created everything and who sustains everything. And, and the way that we do that isn't by winning. The way that we do that is by enduring well. It's, it's funny to me. You know, every time some natural disaster, major natural disaster happens in our world, we wonder like, oh my gosh, is this the fulfillment of Revelation? Is this it? Like several years ago, five, five six years ago, there was this string of hurricanes that came through and, um, and was it Harvey that hammered Houston? What a use of alliteration that was. Um, like there were several, and people were like, is this, is this Revelation? Is it? Um, did, did you know that since 1850, Florida has had over 120 hurricanes. And every single one of them, people are like, wait, is this revelation? Uh, and it, like, apparently only the last few have been affected. Uh, we're affected by climate change, but that's another conversation. Um, <laughs> go ahead and email me, elders at southeastcc.org. Go right ahead. <laughs> Those guys are going to be like, man, I wish I hadn't signed on for this. Here's the thing, like, we, we, natural disasters, like, it's not, you can look at it, like, I don't know, maybe, like, I, like, I don't know, like, I don't know, I don't know, but it hasn't been, like, all of the, that hasn't been so far, so, like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, and, and we can't know, and so the, the question is, why get worked up about it? Now, we've talked a lot in this series about suffering and persecution. And because for the first readers, um, this is how they were going to tell the testimony of who their God is. Um, and it's hard for us to connect with suffering because we don't. Now, individually, we have things that are hard in our life, but as a people who follow Jesus, we don't suffer for the cause of Christ. Many people in our world do, but you and I don't. We don't suffer for the cause of Christ. Um, 
And so it's hard for us to connect to it. And, and so we read this and often kind of get away from, I think, the underlying driver of this for the first readers because we don't, we don't know what to do when we see slavery in India or when we see, um, was it, tw- this was 2016 or 17, there was like 20 Christians beheaded by ISIS, right? And we, we look at that and we go, gosh, it's so sad for them. But what we have to wrestle with is that when the body of Christ suffers, the whole body suffers. It's not them, it's us. And I would say that if we don't understand that, if we don't own some of that weight, then our relationship with Jesus is far too individualistic. And that's a very Western-minded way to look at things, but the problem for you and I is we're called to a community of people. We're not just called to our relationship with Jesus. We're also called to his people, which is messy and hard and radically inconvenient. If someone drops a rock on their foot, their hand doesn't suddenly go, man, it sucks to be a foot. No, the, it goes down and offers comfort, right? That's what the body does. The whole body suffers when any single part does. And the body of Christ must engage global suffering in a way that makes a difference. Because when any part of us suffers, we all suffer. Now, um, Let me give you an example of how this works to our detriment. Because I think for the most part, we have well-intentioned people who maybe misstride a little bit. And and there's a general rule about being helpful. It's only helpful if it's helpful. Right? Sounds simple, but go with me on this. So this uh, movie came out, The Sound of Freedom, on human trafficking, right? And... And there was a lot of people who got really ramped about dealing with trafficking. It, trafficking is a real issue. Like, in, 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 in our own backyard, trafficking is a major issue. Like, we don't have to drive down the street even. Trafficking is an issue right where we live. And all of a sudden, we watch a movie, and now it's something that needs to be dealt with. But what happens is, we're like, we're going to solve it. And we run in blind, ignorant, foolish, and we do all kinds of things to help, but they're not helpful. When there are organizations that are working diligently for years to help in a way that's actually helpful... Because it's not, we're like, we got to get them out of trafficking. Do you understand that that's step one of a hundred other steps? Like, it's not enough to just go, okay, you're free from your pimp or you're free from your traffic or whatever. You're free from them. Yay, look what we did. Because now this is a person who steps into a world they don't understand with no tools to understand how to engage it. And what they wind up doing is going back. But we were helpful. If you want to help trafficking, go become a mentor for people who are trafficked through an organization that's already working with people who are trafficked. Go do that. Go do the hard work of months of training, of of standing in the gap for those people. Go do that. Don't go to them and say, you need to fix the problem. Here's $1,000. Now, give them the money, (laughs) but don't walk away then and go, that was helpful. Because what they need is people who are going to love God and love people enough to actually engage the brokenness in a way that is actually helpful. And it, one of the I, I was I was talking with uh, Joanna Spilly who works with Covered 
Um, and she's like, movies like that actually really frustrate me because for their best intentions, people come to me and they're like, you, you gotta, <laughs> she's like, people come to her who actually does this for a living um, and they're like, you don't understand the problem. And I'm like, <laughs> like, what? How? I watched a movie and now I have a full grasp of what trafficking is. Right? And we often think, like, if I just hug them long enough, if I just let, no, there's actually real, real trauma, it's a real journey, it's a, it's a real investment, and if you're not willing to get really messy with real people's real brokenness, then it's not helpful. Should we engage trafficking? Absolutely we should. But we got to do it in a way that's helpful. We don't understand suffering because we don't suffer. And so what winds up happening is we try to do all kinds of helpful things, but they're not helpful. Now, on the flip side, we can completely abdicate our responsibility as well. It's their problem. That's a bummer for them. Somebody should do something about that. But listen to me. We have to understand how to engage the suffering of the world well. And, and it's complicated. Like for anybody to say, well, if you just did, duh, 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 here's your five steps to solving world suffering. Like that's nonsense. It's complicated, right? Like just consider the clothes that we buy manufactured in foreign countries by children in sweatshops and like not all of it. Like I, I buy sustainable clothing. Good, good. But most people can't afford to pay the increased price to give a fair wage. And so now the, somebody's hurting. Like it's complicated. I get it. It's complicated. But we've got to be willing to step in and do our part to make it right. I don't know what everybody's part is. And we're not all called to solve all of it. But we're, we may be called to solve a piece of it. And we've got to be willing to go there. We've got to be willing to go there. Now, I want to step out of that for just a minute, and I want to tackle this whole issue of Armageddon. Um, people are like, yeah, stop stepping on my toes. My hand says it sucks to be a foot. Um, I want to talk about Armageddon, and Armageddon is this uh, battle at the end of time, and um, all the armies of the world all come together and they fight, okay? So let's talk about it. I'm gonna show you a map. Let me show you a picture. So this map is a map of the ancient world. Um, does anybody know what that green stripe is? It's called the Fertile Crescent. And in the ancient world, this is the sustainer of life. You have this massive desert uh, in between uh, Egypt and Egypt. And Babylon, but Egypt has stuff that Babylon wants, and Babylon has stuff that Egypt wants. And so, what they have to do is they take these massive camel trains and they go up the Fertile Crescent and down and back and forth. They do this way because you can't cross the desert, it's too big, you'll die. Okay? Now, next map. If you look at right in the middle where it says the promised land, do you see that? That's Israel. Now, why is that so important? So here's Babylon over here, Chaldea. You go up the Tigris and Euphrates, turn south, uh, come down here. The promised land is right here. Then we come over to Egypt. This, this promised land area, like why does God put his people here? Um, here's why. Because in the entire trade route, that is the most important piece of real estate and controls the whole thing. You don't have to have a lot of land. You just have to have the right piece of land. Let me help you understand what I mean. There is a 10 mile wide by 60 mile long, north and south, strip of land in Israel called the coastal plain. That coastal plain literally controls the entire trade route. Here's why. Because on one side of it is the Mediterranean Sea. On the other side of it is the Arabian Desert. So you have to go through this tiny little chunk of land. So whoever controls that tiny little chunk of land 
controls the entire trade route. I'll give you a modern day example. Let's say that we are all fans of Disneyland. I don't care if you are or you aren't. Let's pretend for the sake of the illustration that we are. And inside of Disneyland, they have just opened a brand new ride. And all of the ticket counter thing where you boop with your ticket and then you go through the turnstile, um, they're all broken except for one. So all of us who are dying to get on that ride, we have to go through one single turnstile. How important is the person controlling that turnstile? That's Israel. There's all of these goods and services on one side and all of these people on the other side and the turnstile is the access point to all of it. And so what they do is they... Uh, Massive nations, leaders, everybody wants to fight for this. As soon as Alexander the Great dies, his generals war over the, because everybody wants to control this 10 mile wide by 60 mile long piece of property. The, everybody wants to control it. Why? Because if you control it, then you get to tax people to come through it. And taxes make me rich. How much do you tax people? Whatever you want. What are they going to say? No. They have to go through this piece of land. So this is one of the reasons why Solomon is so wealthy. It's one of the reasons why Herod is so wealthy. Like this is a major player in the biblical narrative, this reality for Israel. Okay. Now let's show you, I want to show you a, a picture. This is, next photo, this is the Jezreel Valley. So this is that valley. It's the top, the northern end of that coastal plain. And straight across, you can see it looks like there's kind of a, been a cut into the side of the hill there. That is Megiddo. Now Megiddo is a strategically important city because where the Fertile Crescent um, turns south, Megiddo was placed as a guard city to control that pathway. Make sense? So the coastal plain is critical. How important is this guard city? In order to control the coastal plain, you have to control this city. It's critical. 29 layers of civilization here. 29 layers of civilization. It's been knocked down and rebuilt, knocked down and rebuilt because everybody wants to control it, right? Now it's on a hill called Mount Megiddo. Next photo. This is the, the ruins of Megiddo today. And, you know, they, they've done different levels. Of, you know, the question, the question is how, what layer do you rebuild? You know, for them, it's all part of Israel's history. For us, we're like, we just want the Bible stuff, but we're not funding the dig. So um, they have different places where they've done different things. Uh, this, this is critical. Now, let me show you last photo. The Jezreel Valley is you have Mount Carmel in the south, you have the Kishon Brook. Why is the Kishon Brook important? That's where Elijah kills 450 prophets of Baal after his battle on Mount Carmel. You have Mount Tabor, which is the traditional site of um, the Mount of Transfiguration. It's not the right one, but it's the traditional one. If you come with me to Israel, we'll go to the right one. Um, I had to say it. Nazareth is right there on that hillside. Chatzor, which is another guard city. Uh, Shunem is where Elisha raises a widow woman's son. And Nain is the modern the city in the first century um, where Jesus raises a widow woman's son. Beit Shan is down in the south, 11 miles. And then Mount Gilboa, is the, you can see it in the haze there. That's where uh, Saul is killed. Um, literally, you're looking at 150 Bible stories. Like you could go on and on and on and on and on with all the biblical history that's just in this photo. The Jezreel Valley is four and a half miles wide and 11 miles long. Okay, so this top end. Now, Megiddo is on a hill. I told you that. Hill in Hebrew is Har. So it's known as Har Megiddo. And when you take that from Hebrew to Greek to Latin to German to English, it becomes Armageddon. 
So this is where supposedly it's going to happen. Now, simple question. Can all the armies of the world fit there? No. It's not possible. So let me give you what I think John is doing. And this is, this is my opinion. This is strictly my opinion. But what I think John is doing is not so much trying to call people to a literal battle, but to call them to a place that is very familiar with strategic importance and constant conflict. This place of Armageddon is strategically significant and is a source of conflict. That makes total sense in the broader perspective on the plagues. So that's what's happening. Now, I'm glad we dealt with that. We can easily disregard the bulls of suffering here because we don't know what it means to suffer. And because of that, I don't believe that the body of Christ really understands how to be the body of Christ. It, I want to... So Barna's research group just recently came out with a new report on why Gen Z is leaving the church. Um, let me get on a soapbox for just a minute. I know, totally different than the rest of the message. <laughs> Please hear me all the way to the end. One of the major reasons why Gen Z is leaving the church is because they're fed up with the church bashing culture. Culture wars and culture problems. It's as if we're asking non-Christians to act like Christians. But they're not. Compound that with people who are in the church, people who call themselves followers of Jesus, aren't acting like followers of Jesus. So we want to bash the culture for not acting like Jesus, but in our own world, we're not acting like Jesus either. And so we wind up saying, yeah, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I believe, I believe the Bible's true, I believe, blah, 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 I believe, I believe, I believe. But then we go home and we don't deal with our brokenness. We don't deal with our flesh. We don't deal with the pursuit of the world's values. We don't deal with that. We're not coming to the kingdom to actually make much of God. We want the kingdom to make much of us. We want to leverage God to bless our lives. We don't know how to be the body of Christ. Primarily because we want things from the body of Christ that the body of Christ never promised to give us. We don't want to actually have to look at ourselves in the mirror and deal with stuff. We just want to be blessed. Too blessed to be depressed. Whether I'm blessed or not, which by the way really boils down to amount of perspective, right? Because think about it, the, the breath you just took, that belongs to the Lord. He didn't have to give that to you. But whether or not I feel blessed, God is worthy. And that's the message that the world needs to hear. Not why all their moral decisions are wrong. Let me tell you why they're wrong. Because they don't handle the Bible well. But neither do we. They're wrong because they don't believe that what the Bible says is true. We believe it's true and still don't act like it. I think the bigger issue for us is not to try to get the culture back on track. It's to actually act like a follower of Jesus. I want to read a section out of Amos 5, and this is um, taken from the message. I know. Anytime you say the message, people immediately raise their eyebrows. Um, let me say this about the message. I'll qualify this. Um, Eugene Peterson was 
probably one of the most godliest men I've ever met. Um, he was an acquaintance of mine before he went home. Um, loved that man. Everything that he said was deep. And just about the time that you were like, that's the deepest thing I've ever heard, he would speak again. And you're like, no, wait, that was the deepest thing I've ever heard. Um, it's just who he was, right? Um, and I think there's a lot of good things that he did with the message. I think it's good. It's a good switch up. Always read it alongside a more literal translation of the Bible. That's my one caveat. For this particular passage, I really like how he said it because I think it speaks to the condition of the church today in regards to what we're talking about in enduring and being the body of Christ. Here's what it says. I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. <laughs> I want nothing to do with your religious projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. Now don't be like, yeah, see, the music's too loud. Because that's your ego. When was the last time you sang to me? We talked about this two weeks ago. When we worship, are we just singing a song or are we singing to him? Because if we are, that probably changes the posture and the urgency with which we worship. Do you know what I want? I want justice. Oceans of it. Now I know, I know that the culture has twisted this word to make it something that's really yucky. But at the end of the day, God wants us to care about and do something about the, the suffering in the world. He wants us to do something about it. Not just know about it, not just acknowledge it and go, oh, I have empathy for you, but to actually do something about it. I want fairness, rivers of it, that's what I want. That's all I want. He doesn't... God doesn't need us to be... have all of our doctrine exactly right. And we need to work on getting it right. But he doesn't need us to have all of our doctrine exactly right. Because I'm just going to tell you there's no part about God that you have completely figured out. There's no place where we're completely right. We, we have to hold those, those things that we fight over, those things that we split churches over, we have to hold those with an open hand because God's bigger than my understanding of him. God's bigger than my understanding of the Bible. And I always want to grow and get better and understand it better and be like, we all want to do that, but he's bigger than that. So that's not what he wants. What he wants is justice and fairness. What he wants is for us to care about the suffering of the world and do something. And you know what God does to his people that is often significant and miserable? Is that when there's a a pain in the world that God wants us to understand, he will often take us through that pain so that we have an understanding of what it is to be in it. He doesn't let us escape it. Because when we escape pain, what we do is we fall into the trap of like, oh, that's horrible. That must be horrible for you. When we've been through it, we're like, yeah, I get it. I, 
I have some implications for us this morning. And, and so while we're doing that, our communion team is going to go back and grab the elements. Um, if you're new with us today, we take communion every week together. Um, it's one of the things that we do as a church family. And so anyone who's willing to say Jesus is their Lord and Savior is invited to take communion with us. But we want you to hold the elements till the end and we'll take them all together. While they're passing that out, I want to work through some implications, and um, we're only going to do three today. I know it's edgy. <laughs> we're living right on the edge. So if you're part of our online campus right now, you can hit pause, go grab your, uh, gather your things for communion, come back and hit play. You can pick up right here where uh, we left off. Um, but implication number one is this. Text should always help us interpret other text. It should always help us interpret other texts. And again, it's, it's, it's a dance and we got to know the Bible better and, and do, how do we know this is the right text? And like there's, I get there's some work in that. But text should always help us to interpret other texts because when we do that, what we see in this particular example is that God uses the plagues in Egypt to... This is one of the things that my teacher says that I love. Getting Israel out of Egypt was easy. Getting Egypt out of Israel was hard. That's the purpose of the plagues. Getting us to want to leave this, to go to heaven, is easy. But getting us to let go of the idols and the pursuits and the value structure that we adopt so easily without realizing that we've done it, that's hard. And the plagues force us to refine our own hearts. And that's, that's one of the ways that we, so why wouldn't God just let us escape the plagues? Because if you escape the plagues, you don't get refined into the thing that God's making you. Implication number two. Their suffering is our suffering. It's not enough to just go, man, that must be horrible for them. We need to be actively engaged in trying to be part of the solution. A solution that's actually a solution. Are you with me? A solution that's actually a solution. Not one that's like, well, let me just come up with something. Um, because with the best of intentions, we can do, spend a ton of energy and resources and all that stuff doing things that just aren't actually helpful. We have to be willing, um, and we have, you know, on an annual basis, we have the, um, the National Sunday for the Persecuted Church where we pray for them. And it just feels like it's important. It feel, it's really important. It just feels like we don't give that enough concern. Their suffering is our suffering. Implication number three, Jesus followers are called to engage suffering wherever it is found. We're not called to avoid it. We're called to engage it wherever it is found. And the how and what is it, the strategy and all that stuff, I, I, that's all for us to trust the Holy Spirit to empower us to lead in that. What we have to do is to be willing to say, yes, Lord, I will step into that, regardless of the cost, regardless of the imposition it is on my time. I will step into that. I will make a difference. I will do it. Because in doing this, we represent the heart of the Father to people who are trying to represent the value of the Father, the worthiness of the Father to, to be followed even in hard spaces. We represent the heart of the Father to people who desperately need to be encouraged in that space. Both of those things are important. And, and by the way, you know it's just a matter of time before those rules get reversed. And I need encouragement. Because I'm trying to endure, and they're encouraging me. It's just the way the kingdom works. Whatever we do, we don't do it because we like it. We don't do it because we're too blessed to be depressed. We do it because he's worthy. Which I would offer as we enter into communion time this morning, I would offer this as a maybe a 
introspective thought. How hard do we work to avoid the things that God is trying to lead us into? How often do we find ourselves in a difficult space where we're like, Lord, take me out of this? We pray diligently, desperately even, God, take me out of this, rather than saying, Lord, teach me to endure. What is maybe the space in your life? And if you don't have that space in your life, um, you, can, you have a lot to be thankful for. Because there's a lot of us in the room that do. We do. Whether that space is personal or we're um, on behalf of a friend or a family member, we're struggling, whatever it is, we have these spaces of great pain. Uh, let's take a minute to talk with the Lord about that as we get our hearts ready for communion. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. So whenever you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of me. Let's remember him together. Then after the dinner, he took a cup. He said, this cup, this is the blood of the covenant, which is shed for you. So whenever you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. God, thank you um, Thank you for the, the circumstances we find ourselves in, whether they're easy or difficult. You're the Lord of it all, and you're worthy to be praised and worshiped regardless. Lord, suffering is hard. Thank you for a community of friends who can take our hand and pull us through when we're hurting. We trust you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 